So this is our last set of slides. We're going to talk about the things that live in the ocean uh, that are consumers. Uh, we're gonna focus on the animals. We will talk a little bit about the zooplankton and the protista, uh, and then we'll move right into the animals. So just a brief introduction to the classification system that we use. You've probably heard of this, heard this in biology back in high school. Um, but if you look under natural systems where I have K, P, et cetera, K is for kingdom. That's kind of the highest order. P is phylum. And then we have subphylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And in this set of uh, slides, we're going to focus on primarily the phylum level. We'll do um, a kingdom level stuff and a little bit in the classes, in the orders, um, so if you see those letters, um, that's what they're referring to. K is for kingdom, P, phylum, uh, C, class, and O is order. So let's talk a little bit about some of the key events in animal life. Um, animals are multicellular organisms, and they are consumers. So they require um, food, and they require oxygen to exist. And... If we look in the Earth's history, um, we see at the very early Earth, the oxygen level is quite low in the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, and in fact, early life, there really isn't any uh, oxygen to speak of in the atmosphere. It's all in the ocean. And by about 2 billion years, we're at about 1% oxygen. This is the activity of the photosynthesizers building up over time. By about 400 million years ago, we're at about 20% oxygen, which is very close um, to modern levels of oxygen. Right now, we've got about 21% oxygen in the atmosphere. So you would be comfortable in that atmosphere. And this is thanks to uh, the photosynthesizers or the producers, which we discussed in the previous set of slides. We have a lot of slides here. We're going to go through them kind of quickly. Um, but I wanted to start out by just showing you what life was like in that early ocean. The earliest soft-bodied organisms you can see in the top in the upper right-hand corner, we call them metazoans. It just means they have multiple uh, cells. Um, they are some very strange-looking critters. Some of them look like jellyfish. Some of them we don't know what they were related to. Um, as time moves on, we get to what we think were segmented worms. You can see that in the lower right-hand corner. At that point, up until about 550 million years ago, um, all this life is what we would call soft-bodied. The first shells that we find, the first shell organism, is a thing that we that's been named Claudinia. It's shown in the middle on the bottom there, kind of a very simple-looking shell shows up about 550 million years ago. And then by about 540 million years ago, we have lots of organisms um, with the solid exteriors, which makes them much easier to preserve in the fossil record. And you can see some trilobites down there in the lower left-hand corner. So that's kind of our, our picture of the early ocean. So what does life look like today? Well, um, we started the photosynthetic life with the phytoplankton. So we want to mention the zooplankton as well. Um, these are consumers. Again, they can swim, but they can only swim weekly. They're going to be carried around by the current, and they're generally pretty small organisms. Um, and that leads us right into the kingdom protista. These are the simplest of the organisms. And the protista includes organisms called uh, Foraminifera, they have shells. Um, they are single-celled organisms, but you can see they have these very cool-looking shells in the upper right-hand corner. The radiolarians, also single-celled organisms, uh, they also have shells. And then in the lower right, you can see an amoeba, which is a single-celled organism without a shell. Uh, then we move into the multicellular organisms. So, um, the first phylum is phylum periphera. These are the sponges. Um, you'll notice they do not look like SpongeBob SquarePants. Sponges are pretty simple types of organisms. They really have only a few types of specialized cells. 
Um, one of the key cells that they have is the cell that's got the flagellum that they've kind of highlighted here, um, which helps keep the water moving through the organism. And that cell also helps grab onto food. The water moves through the pores and then circulates up and out of the organism. And as the water circulates through, they are able to grab food out of the water. And nothing on the order of the size of a fish, they're grabbing microscopic organisms and consuming those. For structure, they have a solid, um, they have a little solid thing called a spicule, but it's not anything like a skeleton. It just gives some structure to the organism. The next phylum is phylum Cnidaria. These include the jellyfish, the anemones, the corals. Um, Cnidarians have a radial symmetry, which means if you look at the top, um, it's kind of symmetrical all around in a circular pattern. They have stinging cells that help them capture food. Um, their mouth and their anus is exactly the same opening. So they capture food, they bring it in, they digest it, and then um, they spit out whatever remains. So they can really only have one meal at a time. If you flip this thing over, you'll have a jellyfish. So a jellyfish is basically a, a free-floating um, example of one of these organisms. The next phylum, um, and I don't have pictures of these, but there are some nice pictures in your book, are the worms. So the flatworms are platyhelminthes. You'll notice that they also they're only have one opening into their digestive system. Uh, but they have a little more complicated. They have a simple brain. They have eye spots and a nervous system. Slightly more complex is the next group of worms, the roundworms, the nematodes. Uh, this is the simplest organism with a flow-through digestive system. So that's kind of the, the advance that the nematodes uh, take advantage of. And these are very important sediment feeders. We think they've been around for a long time because even though they're hard to preserve this soft organism as a fossil, um, you can see evidence of them burrowing through the sediment and consuming it when you look for fossils. Next up the list is our third and final type of worm that we're going to mention, which are the segmented worms. An earthworm is a segmented worm. Um, these have a noticeable head, flow through digestive system, and then each segment within the worm has its own circulatory, excretory, nervous, muscle system, and reproductive system. Well, the reproductive system is kind of its own little thing there, but um, you can see what's happening here is they're getting more complicated. And on these slides, I abbreviate things just for uh, to save some space. But uh, circulation, excretion, nervous systems, muscle systems, reproductive systems. So slightly more complicated than the other two types of worms. Our next phylum are the mollusks. And this is the first phylum that you see people kind of consuming and eating. And the mollusks, um, we're going to look at several classes of mollusks. Um, but the mollusks include the squids and the clams. Uh, they are much more complicated organisms. They have circulatory, excretory, nervous systems, um, some fairly complicated muscle systems that we like to eat, and uh, reproductive systems. So. The gastropod mollusks are the snails and the slugs. Uh, gastro means uh, stomach and poda means foot, so stomach foot. The bivalve mollusks are the clams, the mussels, the oysters, and the scallops. Um, a very tasty group, I must say. And uh, this kind of shows you an interesting thing about a scallop. This is the part, the adductor muscle, which holds the shell shut. That's the part that people eat. And the other interesting thing about scallops is that they have eyes. The blue dots that you see on the scallop are all little eyes. They have a whole row of eyes um, on the top and bottom shell um, that you can see when it opens its shell. The cephalopod mollusks are the squids and the, um, and the nautilus. So the nautilus has a shell. You can see that on the left. 
and the squid does not. You can see a giant, a very large squid on the right. And then kind of in the middle there is a creature called a cuttlefish. It looks kind of like a squid. Cool thing about the cuttlefish is that they can change the colors on the outside of the organism. And I've included a link to a video on cuttlefish in our uh, on the class schedule. So if you follow that link, you'll get to see a cool video. Um, the next phylum are the arthropods. These include on land, you're more familiar with insects and spiders, but the arthropods in the oceans are the crustaceans. So the crabs, the krill, the lobsters, the barnacles, those are all arthropods. Um, because they have this solid exoskeleton, they have to shed it if they grow. So you can see a, um, a crab in the upper right-hand corner shedding its uh, exoskeleton and crawling out of that. So those are our arthropods. Uh, the echinoderms are among the most complex, it turns out, of the, um, of the organisms without a skeleton. They have five-way symmetry, which is also kind of a bilateral or, or um, one side versus the other symmetry. Um, and the echinoderms include the sea stars, which is in the upper right-hand corner, the brittle stars, which are in the center, um, and then you can see also in the upper right-hand corner, the purple things are sea urchins, and then on the lower right is something called a sea cucumber. So those are all critters that belong to phylum uh, Echinodermata. Um, some other important phyla that you might find in the ocean, they don't mention much in the book, are the bryozoans. In the upper right, they look kind of like corals, colonial corals, but they're not. And the brachiopods on the lower right um, were a very, very common organism that we find in the fossil record. Um, most of the brachiopods went extinct about 250 million years ago, but there are a few species um, still in the ocean today, including an organism called a lingula that some people may have seen. So then we go into the chordates, and um, this includes anything that's got a spinal cord. So in the upper right-hand corner, you wouldn't think that has a spinal cord, but it does. It's called a tunicate. They're suspension feeders. And in the lower right, that thing looks kind of like a fish, but it's not. It's called a lancelet. And this is an important transitional species from the, um, from the invertebrates to the invertebrate, or to the vertebrates. So within the vertebrates, we have the fish. And now we have seas here. So fish are several different groups um, in phylum chordata. So the agantha are in the upper right. That is a jawless fish called a lamprey. And then the cartilaginous fish, which have skeletons, but not bony skeletons, include the sharks, the skates, and the rays. And then we have our bony fish. And you're welcome to read this slide on your own or read through this in the book, um, but this is class Osteichthyes, and these are the fish that we tend to consume. And you can see a number of the issues. Probably one of the most interesting things about the fish are how efficient their gills are at getting oxygen out of the water. There are no amphibians in the ocean because they have permeable skin and osmosis would dehydrate them, so no frogs in the ocean. But we do have reptiles. You can see we've got the sea turtles and the um, marine crocodiles. I didn't include pictures of the marine lizards and the sea snakes um, in this slide presentation. Uh, we then move on to class aves, which is the birds. There are lots of seabirds. Uh, some of them fly or coast. They glide, spend most of their time over the water. And um, it also includes things like the uh, penguins, which kind of fly in the water. Um, and then we have the mammals are the last few slides. And in your book, I encourage you to read about the, the whales and the carnivores and the sirens. And that is our last slide. We get to end with the very 
cute picture of the 